What is mass wasting and how does it affect our lives? Okay, so in part one, we looked at what mass wasting is and what causes mass wasting. In this video, we're gonna look at how to classify all the different types of mass wasting. Most mass wasting can be classified by using the types of material involved combined with a type of movement. Types of materials are categorized as either debris, earth, mud, or rock. In geology, the word debris describes predominantly coarse-grained fragments from the size of sand grains all the way to house-sized boulders. The word earth is used to denote fine-grained sort of fragments like sand and silt, and in terms of mass wasting can be thought of as what we would commonly call soil. Mud is used to denote, well, mud. And finally, rock is used if we are talking about huge boulders or blocks that broke away from a single solid body like a mountainside. Okay, so now let's take a look at the three basic types of movement. They are flows, slides, and falls. A flow implies that the material, although churning around and around, kind of stays together as a watery, cohesive whole. A slide means that the material not only stays together as a cohesive whole, but it also doesn't churn around in the mix. The whole mass of earth and rock moves intact and sort of slides across the surface of the earth. Notice in this clip that the trees stay mostly upright. A fall is pretty straightforward and essentially describes free falling material. Some textbooks do include speed as a third category for classifying mass wasting events, but for the sake of simplicity, and because this factor is a little more ambiguous, I haven't included it here in this video. So using these two categories and putting a word from this category with one from this category, it allows our overall classification system to be very descriptive. So let's have a look at a debris flow first. As this video shows, and as the name suggests, these flows are made up of all different sized fragments, including boulders that move downhill as a watery, cohesive hole that is constantly being churned up. In this pic here, taken at Split Mountain in Anza Borrego Desert, you can see multiple debris flow events stacked one atop the other. Check out my car for scale. Notice that the rock sizes here are anywhere from sand sized all the way to massive boulders. A debris avalanche is the name given to a special kind of debris flow that moves so fast, material within the flow rarely touches the ground but floats on air that is trapped under the rock and acts as a sort of a cushion. Debris avalanches are thought to travel downhill at speeds of nearly 500 kilometers per hour. The deadliest debris avalanche on record occurred in 1970 when an earthquake triggered a rockfall with an initial volume of 25 million cubic meters. This mass quickly grew to over 100 million cubic meters of mud, rock, and ice as the initial rock fall collided with a glacier before proceeding into the valley below at speeds of over 500 kilometers an hour. Several towns, including the large township of Yongay, were completely destroyed by the avalanche which claimed over 20,000 lives. Since the avalanche buried Yongay in over five meters of debris, the Peruvian government declared the entire site a national cemetery. Okay, moving on to earth flows. Earth flows consist of soils made up of sand and silt. Again, as with debris flows, the soil churns around and around while remaining somewhat cohesive during its downhill descent. One of the deadliest earth flows in recent history is the one that killed 10 people in 2005 when water-saturated earth rapidly tumbled onto the seaside town of La Conquita in California. Living next to mountains can be dangerous. When you have a steep slope and hence gravity at work and lots of water, which in this case was tied to an overabundance of seasonal rain that year, then you have all the ingredients necessary for mass wasting to occur. Not all earth flows, however, move at rapid rates. 
Creep is the name for Earth that moves down the slope at an incredibly slow rate of just a few centimeters a year. You may have seen evidence of creep when you went to grandma's house one year and saw the tombstones in a nearby graveyard all out of alignment. This occurs because the soil is constantly moving downhill but at a snail's pace. Now, we don't have rock flows because rocks are solid and so they don't churn inside. Mud flows, as the name suggests, consist mostly of mud and silt with lots of water that, as with the other two kinds of flows, moves as a sort of a churning cohesive whole. Okay, so let's talk about slides now. Did you know that the word landslide is actually an ambiguous term and is usually not used in geology textbooks? Essentially, every example we've looked at could be called a landslide, so the term is really not very helpful. The word slide, however, is useful. If debris, earth, or rock do not churn when moving, but rather slide downhill as a solid mass, then we add the word slide to be more descriptive, giving us debris slides, earth slides, and rock slides. Mud, however, really moves as a solid mass, and so we shouldn't really use the word mud slide. Better to say a mud flow. Importantly, flows and slides can occur in the same mass wasting event. The La Conquita earth flow mentioned earlier actually started out as an earth slide. As the material sort of reached the bottom of the mountain, however, the soil inside the slide began to churn and so turned into an earth flow. Well, that leaves us with falls. Since debris, earth and mud typically either flow or slide, we don't use the term debris falls, earth falls or mud falls. Usually only rocks free fall and so we only have rock falls in this category. And this happens when overhanging rocks on mountains break away and literally fall to the ground. This happened to the great stone face that existed on Canyon Mountain in New Hampshire. This natural rock formation was called the old man of the mountain because the rock sort of looked like an old man's face. You can imagine how the locals felt when their major tourist attractions succumb to the force of gravity. Okay, so let's do some review here. Do you remember what the two most important factors are in mass wasting? If you said gravity and water, you would of course be correct. Uh, do you remember what the two most important factors are in classifying mass wasting events? If you said the type of material involved and the type of flow, eh, well, you'd also be correct. Remember also that there are four kinds of material types. Uh, there is debris, earth, mud, and rock, and three kinds of flow, and they are flow, slide, and fall. And by porting a word from this category with a word from this category, we can describe just about any mass wasting event we want. Okay, it's time now for our creation fact of the week. Could mass wasting shape enormous geologic features like these in just a few thousand years. Secular scientists, of course, they say no. Consider this quote from a recent textbook. However, even the smallest knowledge of geology shows that the events recorded in today's landscapes cannot possibly have occurred in only a few thousand years, and that emphasis is mine. Yet this belief is tightly bound to the acceptance of uniformitarianism, or as some like to call it, actualism where rates of mass wasting as they occur in the present are used to interpret the past. But what if the geologic past was instead punctuated by massive catastrophic events that precipitated continental-wide mass wasting? Could such catastrophes produce large geologic features like these in just a few thousand years? To test this hypothesis, I will compare small-scale geologic features that rapidly resulted from recent mini-catastrophes with these larger examples that are interpreted in terms of mass wasting over millions of years. The small-scale mini-catastrophes of the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption, the Pleistocene Bonneville and Missoula floods. So let's start with these three canyons here. All three of these canyons are several hundred feet deep and were eroded from solid basalt. Yet these canyons were all cut in just a few months when an ice age lake called Lake Bonneville burst its banks. This massive flood combined with a similar flood called the Missoula flood even generated hundreds of feet thick of both coarse grained 
and even fine-grained sediment, again in just a few months. Smaller scale canyons and deposition occurred during the eruption of Mount St. Helens on the west coast of the United States in 1980. Notice the cutting of canyons in sediment that itself was generated by the volcanic eruption. Given this kind of catastrophic cutting and deposition, isn't it plausible that much larger features such as these could have been generated catastrophically by catastrophic flooding rather than present rates of mass wasting over millions of years. In a creation model, this is precisely what occurred. Many creationists believe that most of the Earth's large geologic features were formed very soon after the flood of Noah. No, not by the flood of Noah. In this model, the Earth still sort of finding equilibrium after globally devastating tectonic movements and flooding would have been a dangerous place to live. Huge local floods, large earthquakes, rapid changes in sea level, uh, massive volcanic eruptions and rapid mountain building, all occurring on continents draped in saturated sediments, would have provided perfect conditions for continental-wide mass wasting. In my particular model, most of the geologic column was actually deposited by regional scale catastrophes in the years leading up to the events recorded in Genesis 6 through 9, which we call Noah's Flood. Uh, this was then mirrored by even more catastrophes in the centuries following the flood. That's a mainstream creationist idea. So back to this quote. This statement, it's simply not true. The fact is, it is possible for all of the planet's modern landscapes to have formed very rapidly. What matters then is one's philosophical commitment to either uniformitarianism or catastrophism. So that's all from me, Dr. C here at Creation Geology for Beginners. Uh, for more resources, please go to my website, www.creationunfolding.com, or of course you can buy my book. Uh, also, don't forget, please hit that like button if you enjoyed the video, and please go ahead and subscribe for easy access to more videos like this in the future.